All right, let's get into the Word. Can't wait. Leviticus chapter 23. We're making our way through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and we are going chapter by chapter, verse by verse on Thursday nights. And we find ourselves tonight in the book of Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, and we are only going to take three verses tonight, uh, though we won't cover a lot of ground in the chapter, we are certainly going to cover a lot of ground uh, tonight. Now what we're praying for and hoping for is that the electricity will stay on until the very end, like it did, la was that I interesting or what? It was like the Lord is saying, no, not yet. He's not done yet. I know he goes long, but as soon as he's done, then the electricity can go out because I want this word taught. I want this word heard. Anyway, that's how I think about it. <laughs> okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this book and this chapter in this book. Lord, we're anticipating you to speak tonight, to minister to us tonight. Lord, to encourage us tonight. We want to hear the still, small voice of your Holy Spirit as you speak to our hearts and really minister to our hearts. Lord, will you give us eyes to see what it is that you desire to show us, ears to hear, that which it is that you would desire to speak to us. Lord, speak. Your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, well, I have really been looking forward to tonight's study uh, for what would be deemed obvious reasons, and that is that this happens to be uh, my favorite topic in all the Bible. <laughs> And that happens to be the rapture. And we happen to find the topic, the teaching of the rapture in, of all places, an obscure place in the book of Leviticus and in the seven feasts given to Israel to celebrate over a seven month period of time. Now what we've been learning is that these feasts have prophetic significance in how they point to the first coming of Jesus Christ and how they point to subsequently the second coming of Jesus Christ and for tonight's study how it points to the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. Now I want to give you an overview and show you all seven of these feasts in their complete form and how they are fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. First, the Passover. This was fulfilled at Christ's crucifixion. The second of the seven feasts, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, was fulfilled with Christ's burial. The third feast, the Feast of First Fruits, was fulfilled on the first day of the week, the Resurrection Day, on that Sunday. The fourth feast we looked at last week, the Feast of Pentecost, also known by uh, its other uh, names, the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Harvest. Uh, it would later be called the Feast of Pentecost and it was fulfilled by and in the birth of the church when the Holy Spirit came down on that day, the day of Pentecost, exactly 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now tonight, we will be studying the Feast of Trumpets. And the Feast of Trumpets clearly speaks to and points to the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. Now, next week, Lord willing, we'll study the last two of the seven feasts, and that would be the Feast of Yom Kippur, which is the Feast of the Day of Atonement. And that is a picture prophetically of the Second Coming. And then, lastly, we'll study the Feast of Tabernacles. Very fascinating study. And this will be a prophetic picture of the Kingdom Age, which is also known as the Millennium, 
and the new heavens and the new earth eternity future. So, verse 23, you can follow along if you haven't turned there already. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 23. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. Uh, put that word convocation in your hip pocket for just a moment. We're going to need it. Verse 25, you shall do no customary work on it, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. So there's the fifth of the seven feasts, the Feast of Trumpets, and in it, to celebrate it, they would blow the shofar, which is not a brass trumpet like we have, like I played in high school. Uh, it is a ram's horn. And if you've never had the privilege of hearing a shofar, you haven't lived. It'll give you chicken skin. It'll make the hair just, I mean, it is so majestic and it is so powerful. And in this study tonight, we're going to see it is so profound and prophetic, but they would blow the shofar, which was to be, again, a holy convocation. Not a word we use much anymore, uh, but we're going to get familiar with it tonight. And it's important that we understand what a convocation is and what this trumpet sound communicated in calling God's people to and for this holy convocation. In the original language of the Old Testament Hebrew, it's the word mikra. Uh, it means something called out, uh, a public meeting. Uh, the act, the persons, or the place, it is translated in the King James as an assembly, a gathering, a calling, a convocation of people to a place. That's what convocation means. Now, this is going to be germane to our understanding of what this trumpet communicated. Now, you have to understand, uh, they didn't have email. They didn't have text messaging. They didn't have any of these uh, social networking sites like Facebook, which by the way, uh, won't you be my friend? <laughs> I'm on Facebook and I'd like to have friends, so send me a friend request. I will in no way uh, cast you out or reject you. <laughs> no, but it's really interesting, this Facebook. Uh, I, I shouldn't get off on this. We don't have the time, believe me, but it's interesting. I'm watching how God's using Twitter and Facebook to further the kingdom. It's really exciting to see what... Uh, anyway, I digress. So... Uh, it's germane to our understanding of what uh, this means. See, this is how God communicated his, to his people. Think about the trumpet sound. Dun, dun, dun. That would be a trumpet sound. Now, what is, what is that? It, it, the, the tone, the tune, the notes from the trumpet would signal a charge. Okay? Uh, so this is what the trumpet would communicate to God's people so as to assemble and gather God's people. So this is what it meant to them then. On the first day of the month, the month Tishri, on the Jewish ceremonial calendar, the Feast of Trumpets was held. Trumpets were blown to gather together God's people for a, watch this now, a holy convocation, relocation, or confrontation. Now, I know those all end in Asian, and I'm certainly not trying to be clever, but I want you to understand that these trumpets meant different things for different people at different times. And that's why at, in our time, this has meaning to us. The Feast of Trumpets is a picture of a holy convocation at the sound of a trumpet for the relocation we call the rapture 
of the church. A second trumpet is for a holy convocation of Israel's confrontation for the last days. Now, I know some of you are looking at me like a dog will look at its owner when it doesn't, you know, quite... <laughs> My prayer in preparation for, I mean, don't, no disrespect, I, you know, uh, especially for those of you who have dogs, that's fine, uh, you know, I, I'm certainly not calling anyone dogs, I'm just saying that you have a very troubling look on your face right now, and I, I hope to clear that up, especially at the conclusion of our time together tonight. This will all tie together, it will all, Lord willing, make sense. I'm praying in, in my preparation for tonight's study, have been praying that God would give you a clarity of thought so that you could think through all that we're going to cover tonight in our understanding of what this feast means to us now today. So it is to gather God's people. See, that trumpet's going to sound, and God is going to gather his chosen people, the Jews. But there's going to be another trumpet, and another trumpet signal is going to gather his people as well. Only it won't be his chosen people, the Jews. It will be his bride. And he's going to gather together his bride. Just as he's going to gather together the Jewish people. So, do you remember last week we looked at the two loaves in the Feast of Harvest? And they were to offer it as a wave offering in the shape of a cross. And the two loaves were a picture of the Jews and the Gentiles. Well, in like manner, we now have two trumpets. And we can find these two trumpets described in detail for us in Numbers, the 10th chapter. And if you're uh, able, I would surely encourage you to turn there. I'd like to read from verses 1 through 7 in Numbers chapter 10. This will fill in a lot of the blanks for us and hopefully con connect a couple of dots for us as well. Numbers chapter 10, verse 1, The Lord said to Moses, Make two trumpets of hammered silver. Silver, by the way, is a picture of redemption. And use them for calling the community together. Convocation, a gathering, an assembling of God's people at the trumpet call before you at the entrance to the tent of meeting or the tabernacle. If only one is sounded, the leaders, the heads of the clans of Israel, are to assemble before you. When a trumpet blast is sounded, the tribes camping on the east are to set out. At the sounding of a second blast, the camps on the south are to set out. The blast will be the signal for setting out to gather the assembly, blow the trumpets, but not with the same signal. Again, this was a communication for a convocation or a gathering. So now we've got two trumpets, we've got two signals, we've got two purposes for these two trumpets that are described for us here in Numbers chapter 10. Now, I need to preface what I'm about to show you with the following statement. The reason why people either A, do not believe in the rapture or B, do not believe in a pre-tribulation rapture is because they have fallen prey to the false teaching of replacement theology. What's replacement theology? It's a false theology that teaches that the church replaces the Jew as God's elect. Don't do that. Don't do that. If you try to do that, then you place the church in the tribulation. If the church replaces the Jews, then you've got some serious problems and quite frankly would need to remove large portions of the pages uh, in your Bibles because you will not be able to reconcile that teaching with uh, the scriptures. Now, God has a covenant with the Jews. And God has a covenant with me and you too. And quite frankly, I don't want God being through with the Jew. And that's an Arab saying that. And here's why. Because if he's through with the Jew, then what's to say that he may, not, may in fact become through with you too? 
See, he had a covenant with the Jews. Now, this is an everlasting covenant. And so if all of a sudden the church replaces the Jews, then I'm really insecure in my salvation because under the new covenant, that means that God could replace me too as he did supposedly with the Jew. See, I don't want God being through with the Jew because he has a covenant with the Jew and he has a covenant with me and you too. So the church cannot replace Israel. And if you try to replace Israel with the church, then all of a sudden the teaching on the rapture, it's all kapakahi. Forget a pre-tribulation rapture. Now the church has to go through the tribulation. See, understand that the purpose of the tribulation is for the salvation of the Jewish nation. We're already saved. That seven-year period of time is called the time of Jacob's trouble. Who's Jacob? Well, God changed his name and his social security number and everything else from Jacob to Israel. Uh, <laughs> it's not the time of the church's trouble. Now, why do I preface this this way? Because if you don't understand that at this point, then everything that we're going to look at tonight is going to be confusing to you. Because there's two trumpets. There's a first trumpet, there's a last trumpet. There's a trumpet of God and there's a trumpet of angels. And they have two signals, these two trumpets. One is for Israel, and one is for the church. And that's what we're going to see. The first trumpet, first, is for Israel. And we see this first trumpet in Exodus 19, uh, verses 16 and 17. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God. There's your convocation. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. That's the first trumpet. That's the first mention of this trumpet or a trumpet in the scriptures. It's abiding by the principle of first mention. Now, this first trumpet, the morning of the third day, according to Hosea, the prophet, chapter 6, verse 2, is for Israel to meet the Lord. And some believe that this is because a thousand years for us is as one day to the Lord, that on the third day, the morning, the beginning of the third 1,000th year, very possible because it all fits with the typology. See, from the beginning to the present has been approximately 6,000 years. That's been six days to the Lord. Because a day of the Lord is like a thousand years for us. So this is the first mention of the first trumpet and it's for Israel. The last trumpet is for us. And it's very clear. The scriptures are explicitly clear. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52. The Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth is talking about the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. And he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ, this is a bodily resurrection, shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now again, this is where the mid-tribbers, the pre-rathers, the no-rapture believers, the, you know, I don't know what you want to call them, pre mid post, post-toasty, whatever you call them. But this last trumpet is not the seventh trump in Revelation 
7 at the middle of the tribulation. But this is the trumpet of Revelation chapter 4 verse 1, which we're going to see here shortly. And it happens at the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. Uh, I, I must tell you that tonight, we're not only going to learn about the rapture, we are going to also learn why the rapture has to take place before the seven-year tribulation and why that matters. Why that matters. It is vital. I, I cannot overstate this. It is absolutely crucial that we as the church know that the rapture of the church happens before the seven-year tribulation. Okay, I feel better now. I had to get that off my chest. <laughs> Let me just draw your attention to Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Again, this will come into clearer focus here in a moment. After this, I, John is speaking, looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven, and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a what? Trumpet said, come up hither, come up here. John is raptured up to heaven. Did you know that in everything from Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 on through to Revelation chapter 22 is yet future? Again, this is exciting and I can't wait till we get to this uh, in a moment. Uh, a couple hours at least will be there, so just hang tight. <laughs> now, you've got trumpet of angels and trumpet of God. Two trumpets. The trumpet of angels is for Israel. Matthew chapter 24, verses 20 through 22 and verse 31. Listen, Jesus says, But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day, He's speaking to the disciples. He's speaking about the Jews. The church certainly does not worry about uh, travel arrangements on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath day, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake. Who's the elect? Israel. I thought the church was the elect. Well, yes and no. In the context of what Jesus is saying here, he is not speaking to the church. He's speaking to the Jews. And, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather, there's your convocation, together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. This is the last trumpet. It's of angels for Israel, God's elect, and it happens at the end of the tribulation. When the whole house of Israel comes to salvation, which is the purpose of the tribulation for them as the Jewish nation. Okay. Now, the trumpet of God is for us. Uh, this is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. My favorite verse in all the Bible. I know I say that about all the verses, but this one really for sure is. The Apostle Paul to the Thessalonian church in the context of the rapture is wanting to encourage them. And he says to them, chapter 4, verse 16, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up. Hang on to that word for just a second. Caught those two words. Together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Okay. You know when somebody says to you, well, the word rapture isn't even in the Bible. And they say it just like that. You just want to, you know, you just want to, you know. <laughs> Do something. I don't know what. You have an answer for them. Well, that depends, my dear friend. <laughs> because if you have a Latin Bible, then the word rapture is there. 
It's a transliteration of the Latin Vulgate rapturus, where we, tra since there's not really a word, we just sort of, instead of translate it, we transliterate it to, uh, in, uh, to rapture or to be caught up. In the Greek, it's harpazo, uh, which makes me very glad that they chose rapture because harpazo just doesn't do it for me. <laughs> it, it seems slow, doesn't it? Rapture is one of those words that just says, rapture us away. You know, harpazo seems so slow. So I like rapture. And plus, you'd have to change all your bumper stickers if it was harpazo. Anyway, so that word caught up is two English words that are used from the New Testament Greek to translate harpazo, which in the original Latin Vulgate is rapturous. Rapture, which means to be caught up with great force. So the next time somebody says that, say, okay, and pull out your Latin Bible. You can get them on Amazon. You can't read it, but you can read that verse <laughs> and that word and point it to it. No, right here. <laughs> Take that. Okay. Two trumpets. The first trumpet for Israel, the last trumpet for the church. The trumpet of angels for Israel, the trumpet of God for the church. Okay, so both trumpets were to gather God's people. What is the trumpet for Israel going to gather God's people for? I mean, we know what the trumpet for us is going to gather us for. It's going to assemble us, a holy convocation, to meet the Lord when he catches us up and we meet him in the air. But did you know that the trumpet call could signal a wedding or it could signal a war? Now this again is germane to our understanding. Now, if you go into the ancient Jewish bridal customs, you will find a beautiful picture painted on the canvas of the relationship that we have between us as the bride and Jesus Christ as the bridegroom. Do you know that in every instance when Jesus talked about uh, the church and going to prepare a place that he was speaking as a groom to his bride? Even the communion celebration which is the Passover celebration, was a part of the ancient Jewish bridal customs. Now, I'm going to go through these. We'll move as quickly as we can. I'll try not to talk uh, too fast. And I do want to let you know again that if you want to get uh, all of these notes, they will be available in a PDF format on our website. You can download them. Uh, Lord willing, we'll have them up there early next week. If you can't wait, uh, you can email me. I'd be happy to email you the uh, PDF or the, yeah, the PDF. Or if you want a photocopy, we can get a photocopy to you as well. Because what we're going to do here is we're going to see how that the trumpet plays a part in the wedding customs and how the wedding customs in a traditional Jewish wedding picture our wedding to the Lamb. Every little detail is a picture of a, the rapture of the church and not just the rapture of the church but a pre-tribulation rapture of the church as we'll see in a moment. Here it is. The groom's father makes the match uh, called the Shidduchim, and chooses the bride, and the groom approves the choice. The father chooses us as the bride, and Jesus, the groom, approves the choice. John 10, 28, and John 15, 16. A marriage covenant, ketubah, is made in writing for the bride as a promise to the bride that it will be fulfilled just as it is for us. A new covenant is made in the written word of God. That's what the new covenant is for us as the bride. And it fulfills the old covenant promise, just as it was supposed to do. 2 Corinthians 3, 5, and 6. 
They, now the bride, the groom at the betrothal, would break bread and drink from the cup to seal the betrothal, the kiddushin, and the new covenant. This is why, and I'm getting ahead of myself, we'll see in a moment, Jesus said this is the blood of the new covenant. And I'm going to paraphrase here if you don't mind, but he says, I can't wait until I partake of this again with you in my kingdom. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb, man. I can't wait. You want to talk about a wedding? I love doing weddings. But this is one wedding I cannot wait for. I tell you. It, and you know what makes it even more exciting? Uh, there's going to be food there. It's the wedding supper. That means there's food. In... <laughs> the groom then pays a price, mohar, showing the bride his love for her. Just as Jesus paid the price for us on the cross because of his love for us. 1 Corinthians 6, 20. It gets better. The groom makes a speech of promise to his bride that he would come for her soon. This is just the engagement now. This is just the, the engagement, the breaking of bread, the drinking from the cup, the, the, the new covenant, the promise. And just as Jesus' speech is recorded as a promise to us as his bride that he will come again for us soon, John 14, 1. The groom then goes to prepare a place for his bride, a bridal chamber, if you will, and he does it at his father's house where he proceeds to build a room addition. Jesus said, Behold, I go to prepare a place for you. In my father's house, there are many dwelling places or many mansions, depending on which translation you have. And if it were not so, I would not have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And where I go, there you will be also. And in other words, my bride at our engagement, my promise to you is that I will come for you and I will snatch you away and I will take you and we will go back to this room addition, this bridal chamber that I built in my father's house. And there we're going to celebrate and consummate our marriage. That's what he was saying. John 14, 1 through 3. The father then is the only one who knows the day or hour of the groom's return for his bride. Not even the groom. That's why Jesus said not even the Son of Man knows, only the Father. And so that day or hour that no one knows will come, and when it does come, he comes and he gets his bride, but he doesn't come all the way. He comes halfway, and he snatches her away. Okay, the groom gives the bride, we're still at the engagement now, the groom gives the bride love gifts, matan. Jesus as our groom gives us, as his bride, gifts of love, the gift of eternal life, peace, etc. John 10, 22 through 28. John 14, 13, 14, and 27. The father gives the bride gifts, the shiluhim, to equip her for her new life as an inheritance. We are given the gift of the Holy Spirit and spiritual gifts for our new life in Him, Him as our inheritance, John 14, 16, and 17, 2 Corinthians 1, 21, 22, and also the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22. The bride's unmarried friends, the bridesmaids, attend to the bride and provide light for the groom who comes at night when the hour, when the day and the hour comes. We prepare the bride by letting our light shine so the bride is ready for the groom who comes as a thief in the night, which means the bride didn't even... That would be really difficult because how are you going to send out invitations? Please come to my wedding. Date? Don't know. <laughs> hour? Time? Day? Don't know. Nobody knows. <laughs> it's going to come as a thief in the night. And the groom will come and snatch away the bride. The bridegroom comes. The groom's men run ahead and shout that he's coming. That's the trumpet shout. 
when our bridegroom comes, it will be a shout of the trumpet call that Jesus is coming for his bride. The groom snatches away, abducts, if you will, his bride, just as Jesus, our groom, will rapture us away as his bride. The groom takes his bride to the chamber. They consummate nisuim and celebrate for seven, a period in Hebrew known as Shavua days, just as Jesus will take us to his bridal chamber where we will consummate and celebrate for seven or a period of seven, seven years. The party waits outside until the groom tells the best man that it is consummated. Then the guests rejoice for seven days, and during the seven-day, or in our case, seven-year celebration, the world goes through the seven-year tribulation. One has said that while we're celebrating, they are tribulating. Yeah, tribulating is probably not a word, but let's just say it is for purpose of our study tonight. Now, there's a big feast, the wedding feast. When does it happen? After the wedding celebration. After the period of seven, completion, the consummation is completed. Just like we too will go to the Father's house for the marriage feast of the Lamb. Now, bear with me for a moment, please. If the tribulation... If the, if the rapture is anywhere but at the beginning of the seven-year seven tribulation, then you just messed up my honeymoon. <laughs> Yours too. And you really messed up the wedding feast. Because now I'm rushed. Now it's more like brunch. <laughs> no, here's why. Because you see, <laughs> at the rapture, Jesus comes for us. At the second coming, Jesus comes with us, ten thousands by his side, as his bride. Like we talked about last week, how God made a bride for Adam from his side, the rib. So too did God make a bride for Jesus, the second and final Adam, from his side. So don't mess with the typology here. Ask Moses about messing with the typology. Remember when he struck the rock the second time? God said, Moses, come here. I didn't tell you to strike the rock. I said, speak to the rock. You were only supposed to strike the rock one time, and then water would come out. And you know that that one act of disobedience cost him the promised land? Wow, that seems like that it's disproportionate, you know, the punishment to the crime. My goodness, I got a little bit carried away. I struck the rock. That's what worked last time. Water came out. I mean, come on, what's the problem? What's the big deal? Why, why won't you let me into the promised land? Because, Moses, you ruined the typology. See, the rock is Jesus, and he was only to be struck once. He only is crucified one time, and then the living water comes out. After that, you only speak, and the water will come out. You ruined the typology, Moses. That's why. So too, you don't want to mess with the typology when it comes to the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. Well, there were three groups present at the wedding, the groom, the bride, and the invited guests. There will also be three groups uh, present at the marriage of the lamb, the groom, Jesus, the bride, which is the church, and the um, uh, guests, which are those that will be saved after the rapture in the tribulation, the tribulation saints, as they're called, the ones that John says, uh, who are these, Lord? So there will be people that will get saved after the rapture. It won't be easy, and it will cost you your head, <laughs> quite literally, but it is possible. The new home of the bride was Jerusalem, and it was the bridegroom who came to the bride to dwell with her. It is from the new Jerusalem that believers in the Messiah during the Messianic age or millennium, that 1,000-year rule and reigning with Christ, uh, with the Messiah, that we will rule and reign with him. And again, here's the distinction now. 
The difference between the bride, see, they're going to be saved after the rapture in the seven-year tribulation, but they won't be the bride. They'll be saved. They'll be saints, but they won't be the bride. And the distinction is that the saints that are saved after the rapture in the tribulation will be serving the Lord at the throne, but we as the bride will be seated with the Lord on the throne. And therein lies the distinction. So somebody says, well, I'm just going to wait till you guys all disappear, if it's really true, and then I'm going to get right with God. Okay, be my guest, quite literally, because you're going to be my wedding guest. <laughs> is that cruel? Is that bad? Is that wrong? Not very pastoral or loving, is it? I know, but I'm just a mean guy. Okay, now here's the thing. The communion table. This was a bridal uh, celebration at the engagement because, see, when the bride accepted the cup, she was saying, I do. Yes, I will marry you. And that's what the communion table meant. To anyone who hears the message of the basar or the gospel, it is a wedding proposal by God to accept him and be a part of his bride. God desires that we accept his invitation and give him our response of I do. In fact, Revelation 22.20 20 is a proposal by Yeshua himself to accept him and be a part of his bride. His message in this verse is come. The way the bride said I do was to take the cup and break the bread. The way I say I do to the Messiah's marriage proposal is to partake of his cup and broken bread. See, it was a common union. No longer two, we become one. See, in my culture, in the Arab culture, I'll just share this real quickly and we'll uh, move on. Uh, everything is centered around food. This is why the, the wedding feast is so exciting to me. I can't wait for the food. It's going to be delicious and fat-free and no cholesterol, nothing. But uh, everything is centered around food. See, in the Arab thought, uh, if you break bread at a at, at table with an Arab, uh, you are now loyal to that uh, friend till death. Um, and the thought is, is that when you eat of the same bread, that bread that's in you is the same bread that's in me. When you drink, when I was a kid, man, I used to get freaked out when I would see my uncles come over, my dad, my mom, and my aunties would spend months preparing this feast. And uh, they would have this, you know, rice that you would eat with your hands. Uh, by the way, we're, we're very, uh, <laughs> I'll never forget when I took my, my precious bride to meet my folks for the first time when we were engaged. And I was already apologizing to her, saying, okay, now, listen, uh, we, we don't do things the way you do in our, <laughs> you have to understand, in our country, it is, you know, <laughs> I was trying to, you know, prepare her because I knew it was going to be a shock to her when she got there. And sure enough, we're sitting around the table and we, <laughs> we eat with our hands. We just, and they have this rice dish and, at weddings. And I'll never forget, the first wedding as a kid that was, you know, one of my uh, Arab family members. And they, the men would all hover around this huge mound of rice and stick their hands and stuff their face and eat. I mean, that is just disgusting. <laughs> And you know the, the, the uh, hummus and the baba ganoush and all those, and then the, the bread, you know, the unleavened bread or the pita bread, and you, you break the bread and you dip it in the, they double dip. <laughs> <laughs> and, you ready for this? They drink from the same cup. And they eat from the same. When Jesus was there, don't, please don't sanitize and tidy up the Lord's Supper. Picture them there and forget this painting where they're sitting around this table. My goodness. Perish the thought. They're on the floor reclining at the table. Eating with their hands. What are these nice little cups? <laughs> And Jesus takes the bread and he breaks it and he says, here, same piece of bread. Because those germs that are in you are the same germs that are in me because we're a common union. 
Uh, one, one last thing. I had uh, my mom's side of the family. We had a family feud. You don't want Arabs having a family feud. It is really not a pretty picture. Lasted for seven years. And then finally it was time to come together and uh, make a reconciliation. So they planned this huge feast to resolve this feud. To come together once again, reconcile and have a common union. I'll never forget it as long as I live. And what that did was it sort of sealed the deal. You know when uh, Yasser Arafat and Yitzhak Rabin uh, with then President Bill Clinton on the White House lawn in September of 1993 signed the Oslo Peace Accord? It meant nothing to the Arab. You know why? Because Rabin did not break bread with Arafat. They never ate. Anwar Sadat of Egypt did. That's why he was assassinated. See? Because I'm loyal now to the death. Why? Because we ate together. And that's what Jesus was saying. Because we eat together. Here, you know, eat. This is my body broken for you. In my death for you. See? I want to talk about the pre-tribulation rapture. And why I, yeah, I know that's cute. <laughs> you know, it's not enough to just know what you believe. It's important to know why you believe what you believe. Now, I was reading a, a book uh, that Don Stewart sent me called The Rapture. And at the beginning of the book, he's really, you know, Don's a great guy, good friend. Just talks about how, you know, we need to be respectful towards other believers who do not hold to a pre-tribulation rapture belief. And I certainly don't want to sound militant. And I know sometimes I can be guilty of that, accused. What? <laughs> am I that bad? <laughs> but I am passionately dogmatic about why the rapture has to be before the seven-year tribulation. Now, I'm not going to have the time tonight to go into all the reasons why, but I do want to talk to you about the typology in the scriptures, beginning with Daniel, who was pre-furnace, if I can say it that way. Now, look at the parallels here, okay? You have Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, they are a picture of the uh, Jews, whereas Daniel is a picture of the church. Here's why and here's how. This takes place in Babylon. There are two last days Babylons, uh, Revelation chapter 17 and chapter 18. One is an economic Babylon, one's an ecclesiastical Babylon or a religious Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar makes an image. The Antichrist will make an image. The measurements of Nebuchadnezzar's image are six cubits high by six cubits wide with six instruments that are listed there. And the number of the name of the man, the Antichrist, in Revelation 13 is to be counted. And it too will add up to six Six, six. The six instruments are played, then they are to worship the image of Nebuchadnezzar. Lucifer was the angel of music, and music will play a role in the worship of the image of the beast. All the rulers of every nation and tongue are united together in one religion in ancient Babylon. All the world will come together and be united under a one world religion in the new Babylon. Three Jews refuse to worship the image of gold. The Jews will reject the worship of the image of the Antichrist in the tribulation when he sets up his image and demands to be worshipped in the newly rebuilt temple. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego go into the fiery furnace just as Israel will go into the fiery hot tribulation. The furnace is turned up seven 
times hotter. The tribulation lasts for seven years. An angel like the Son of God protects them in the fire. Jesus, the Son of God, will protect them, the Jews, in the tribulation. After rejecting the false worship, they see their true and living God. So too will the Jew in the tribulation, after rejecting the worship of the Antichrist, accept the true and living Christ, their Messiah. Right before all of this, Daniel was placed up in a high position by the king. He's conspicuously absent from the whole furnace thing. Right before all of this happens, we will be caught up to our high position with our king. Daniel was lavished with many gifts. We are lavished again with many gifts. Daniel was put in charge and reigned over the entire province as a ruler. We will rule and reign with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Again, we as the bride rule and reign with him during the millennium. Daniel remained in the royal court. We as the bride will remain in his royal court seated with him on the throne. So Daniel was pre-furnace. Enoch was pre-flood. Look at the typology here. As in the days of Noah, so too will it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. You have Enoch, a picture of the church, and you have Noah and his family, a picture of the Jews. The wickedness of man was great on the earth, Genesis 6-5. We are certainly in a time of great wickedness on the earth, and it's waxing worse. Very few people were following God's ways, we're told. So too, in our day, the gate is narrow and very few people are walking with the Lord. God warned his people. God is warning his people today. They didn't understand that judgment was coming upon them. Uh, people today don't understand that the tribulation is coming upon them. They would not repent, though God gave them time. And God is seemingly slow in our day in his coming. Why? Because he's not willing that any should perish, and he's giving man time. There was no great revival in the days of Noah. And I am not of the school that there's going to be a revival in our day. In fact, if anything, you could argue from the scriptures that there's going to be the antithesis of a revival and there's going to be really a falling away. Now, I do believe there's going to be a gathering uh, until the fullness of the Gentiles is complete. In other words, until that last Gentile gets saved. That, By the way, if you're here tonight and you're a Gentile, <laughs> you ain't leaving here till you, because well, I want to go home. Okay, I, that would be, could you imagine we'll, we'll show up in heaven and go, yeah, we, the last one was at Calvary Chapel, Cody, oh, hey. <laughs> which will be mixed with, received with mixed response, so you held us up. <laughs> in Noah's day, they went about things as usual, eating, drinking, and marrying. In our day, it's business as usual, and people are eating, drinking, and marrying. God set in Noah's day an exact day and time where we're told in Genesis 7, 4, for yet seven days. God has set an exact day in our day and time yet for seven years there will be a tribulation. Noah... And his family go into the ark and through the great flood. The Jews will go into and through the great tribulation. Where's Enoch? Well, right before all of this, Enoch walked with the Lord. Then he was no more. Why? Because God took him away. He was caught up. He was raptured up. And he was taken away right before 
the tribulation, right before the uh, flood. So too, right before the tribulation, we who walk with the Lord, have a saving relationship with the Lord, won't be here. Why? We will be no more. Why? Because he's going to take us up, up and away. <laughs> okay, it doesn't quite work, but oh well. Now, I want to address something here that needs to be addressed because some will take this and create a, what they call, partial rapture theory, which means that only those obedient Christians will be raptured up and the ones who, well, are not obedient or lukewarm or, you know, uh, they will be left uh, behind. I'll tell you why that has problems. Here's the short answer and why I don't think you can support it in the scriptures. Uh, the rapture is a work of God's grace, not works. If you're walking with the Lord here today, you will be raptured up, caught up like Enoch was. If you subscribe to a partial rapture theory, you insert the unthinkable, and that is salvation by works. All of a sudden now, the onus is on me, and that's not scriptural. Okay, we're going to close. Uh, if you could just bear with me, I'm going to have to move a little bit faster here because I want to draw your attention to the book of Revelation. This cinches it for me, okay? The book of Revelation for me is enough. It's all I need to believe that the rapture has to take place before the seven year tribulation. Here's why. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 19, John, there on the island of Patmos, the year approximately 95 AD, is told to write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. In the Greek, metatauta, or after these things, yet future. In other words, John is given a divine outline for the book of Revelation. And if you study the book of Revelation, you'll find that it is broken up into three sections. Past, present, future. Now, what's so significant about that? Well, what's so significant about that is that verse four, chapter 4, verse 1 is the rapture of the church. And you have this divine outline, and I'll give you a thumbnail sketch of it real quickly. Past is chapter 1. What's past? Jesus Christ crucified, buried, and resurrected, seated at the right hand of the Father. That's past tense, chapter 1. What's present? Chapters 2 and 3. What are chapters 2 and 3 about? The church H. Seven letters to seven churches. By the way, if ever the Lord presents the opportunity, I would love to do another teaching on the seven churches because they were seven literal churches in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, uh, starting with the church of Ephesus, then Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and then the last one, the seventh one, the church of Laodicea. And they paint a prophetic picture of the church age presently. And it's a prophetic picture as beautifully painted as the seven feasts, the seven churches. And we're going to see how this book of Revelation even ties into the seven feasts in just a moment. Now, chapter 1 past, chapters 2, 3 present, chapter 4 on future. That which will take place after these things. Watch this. Chapters 4 and 5 are the rapture. Chapters 6 through 19 are the tribulation. Chapter 20 is the millennium. And chapters 21 and 22 are the new heavens and the new earth. Are you getting this? I hope so, because I'm going to test you on this next week. Now, why do I give you this outline? Because... The church is mentioned 19 times in chapters 1, 2, and 3, and never again mentioned from chapter 4 on, especially in chapters 6 through 19, which are all about the tribulation. Why is the church not found in chapters 6 through 19? Because the church isn't in the tribulation. <laughs> 
I'm not the sharpest knife in the kitchen drawer, but this is pretty clear to me. And you know that the book of Revelation is the only book in the entire Bible that promises a blessing to those who read it, hear it, and take it to heart? Three things. Read it, hear it, and take it to heart. And yet the book of Revelation is the most terrifying book to Christians. Tell, tell someone that, hey man, you should have come to Bible study with me. You know, Thursday night we were in the book of Leviticus. <laughs> That's okay. American Idol was on tonight. I, last night I didn't. And then we studied the book of, of Revelation. You studied the book? Why do you want to do that? Isn't that a hard book to understand? No. The book of Revelation reveals, unveils, and that's what apocalypsos or revelation in the original Greek means. It's an unveiling book. God is unveiling what's going to take place after these things, after church history. So you have this chronological order in the book of Revelation from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 22 in this divine outline. Now watch how the feasts fit with this is so cool. <laughs> Past tense. Write that which w was, uh, is now, and will take place after these things. Chapter 1. Jesus Christ crucified, buried, and resurrected. That's Passover, unleavened bread, and uh, 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 first, yeah, I knew that. First fruits, right here. I, got, I should probably read my notes. Chapters 2 and 3, present, the church age, the feast of Pentecost, when the church is born. Chapter 4 and 5, the rapture, the feast of trumpets. Chapter 6 through 19, the Great Tribulation, that's the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, where finally Israel makes atonement and comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And the millennium is the Feast of Tabernacles, as we're going to see, and so too the new heavens and the new earth. Oh, I wish I could have more time. I wish we could just not have clocks. Can I ask you, we're going to close. Can I ask you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? I suppose you could say this is the wrapping of the bow around the whole thing of the why behind the what of the pre-tribulation rapture. Do you know that one of the main reasons why the Apostle Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the two letters to the church in Thessalonica? It was because they had been deceived and had believed that they had missed the rapture. So the Apostle Paul's going to write to them to encourage them to let them know that they didn't miss the rapture. And that's really what it's about. I love the Thessalonian letters. Now, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 and 18, the Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, says to them, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep with, in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. And watch verse 13. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Okay, forgive my cynicism, but if I believe in a mid-tribulation rapture or pre-wrath, which I guess uh, uh, Frank reminded me there's some di differences there, uh, if I believe in that, how am I going to do verse 18? Can you imagine if the rapture is anywhere but at the beginning of the seven-year tribulation, you're going to tell people, 
you're going to go through cataclysmic death. A third of the earth's population is going to die. Hailstones, plagues. I mean, it's just going to be awful. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. <laughs> it doesn't work. Please. Please. He's telling them. The Lord's going to take you and you can encourage each other because you're going to be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Can you just give me a couple more minutes? I'm almost done. I really am. I, I'll, I'll let you read. This is your homework. 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 1 through 11. You need to read that. You're going to be tested on it next week. This counts for the semester. All right. It's the pre-tribulation rapture that gets me out of bed every morning. It's the pre-tribulation rapture that gets me through every day. It's the pre-tribulation rapture that allows me to put my head as aching as it is on that pillow at night and allows me to fall asleep. It's that pre-tribulation rapture that encourages me and gives me the hope to keep pressing on to the prize of the high calling. Because you see, like Paul said, when that trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. And we who are alive and remain are going to be also caught up and we're going to meet the Lord in the air. We're going to be given our new bodies, which by the way, I can't wait. I'm looking at this thing and it's got a lot of miles on it. I need a new body. Lord, come quickly. Especially given the current situation with the upcoming health care uh, situation. But anyway, that's another topic for another time. I shall be talking about that on Sunday morning, by the way. Uh, but do you know what that means? How many of you here tonight have loved ones who passed away in Christ? Yeah, put your hands up, would you? Oh my goodness. Do you know what this means? They, they get right, 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 raised from the dead first. Their bodily resurrection, they're given their new bodies first, and then we're going to meet them. You're going to see them. You're going to see them. Listen, I, I can't wait to see my daughter. I can't wait to see my mommy. I hope to see my dad. But I can't wait because Noel, my daughter who died, is going to be risen from the dead first. And I'm going to see her, and I'm going to see my mom, and more importantly, I'm going to see my Jesus. Amen. Now listen, if that doesn't encourage you, you need to see me after we close tonight. Because you got something really is, you know, you got a condition. I'm sure they have clinical terms for it, and we want to maybe pray for you, lay hands on you, because that... One last thing, I, and we're done. This will be my final closing. Final closing right here. This is it, right here. Some of you tonight may not, I mean, you know you're not going to go through the great tribulation, but you are going through trials and tribulation. Does it not encourage you to get through whatever it is you're going through because of what you have to look forward to? Let me say the same thing a different way. Knowing that soon and very soon I'm going to go to see the Lord. <laughs> that kind of changes the complexion of my circumstances. The financial difficulty. The hardship. The trials of life. The cares and the affairs of the day. In light of this, I think, mm -hmm. the sufferings of this world cannot be compared with the glory that awaits. The happiest Christians and the most joyful Christians I know 
are the ones who have this hope. Conversely, the most confused, the most uh, joyless uh, Christians I know are the ones who don't know, and therefore they're not encouraged. So be encouraged tonight. Be encouraged tonight. Very soon, with everything that's taken place in the world today, the rapture of the church is very close. And our groom is coming for us as his bride. Why don't you all stand? Father, we're in awe of you because of who you are and how you are and how good you are to us. Lord, we long for the day, and I think all of us would say, Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. But in a bittersweet way, there are many whom we love and pray for who do not know you yet. So, Lord, I pray that if anything has happened here tonight, that at least there's been an urgency that's been created in our hearts to first be ready for you, be watching for you, and for your return for us, but even more so to let others know that they might too be ready. Lord, thank you. We love you so much. In Jesus' name.